So, well, welcome to today's episode. Welcome to um, a conversation with Susan Norwell, one of my mentors, one of my teachers that I have been honored to observe and learn from. She has inspired me greatly, and I hope today that you will also be inspired by her. She's a special ed teacher. She has um, done great things, and um, yeah, I'll tell you a little bit more. Maybe you can tell a bit more about yourself. So um, I'm a master's level teacher with certainly courses beyond that, but my, I think my greatest claim to fame is that I started Brett University, and so that was a a goal of mine for many, many years, five years in the making. And um, God magically put me in touch with the right people <laughs> so that I could make it happen. So that's my goal is to really help get out there. What are the strategies we can, we can use? What are the success stories? What are the ways we can actually educate children that have complex disabilities, not just RET, but complex disabilities, mainly RET? Um, because I think that a lot of people don't know what to do. And when they don't know what to do, they do nothing. Yes. That's and a that great one. When we just, don't, yeah, it, yeah. When we don't know what to do, right. we just kind of freeze and we don't do anything. Right, or we do what we've been taught, and what we've taught doesn't work with kids that are really complex. And then the teacher gets frustrated, and and no teacher goes into teaching not wanting to be successful with their students. Um, but I know I taught graduate students for ten years. I know we are not prepping our teachers enough to work with the kinds of kids that I work with. We're just not. Yeah. So what is one of the first lessons you teach your students or you taught your students in grad school for special education? So I really distinctly remember showing my students this video of this young man who was a quadriplegic with CP. And what you see is this in the video is you see his feet on a touch talker. I mean, it's like an ancient old talker. And with his toes, he's typing things out. And as the camera pulls back, you see him kind of papoosed because his arms are so out of control. He's kind of papoosed. He's in this chair. And I stop the video and I say, okay, who do you think was the first person to say there's something inside this guy that we need to get out? Who, who do you think that person was? And they like have all these, you know, guesses about different professionals. And I went, no was his parents. Hmm. The professionals all said, hey, he can't do anything. It was the parents. So what kind of teacher are you going to be? Are you going to be the kind of teacher that sees the possibility in somebody that cannot move their hands, cannot use their, I mean, he was just all over the place. Who would have thought to stick something down by his feet? Somebody who was desperate to figure out what he was trying to say. I want my teachers, I always tell them that, I want you all desperate to figure out the puzzle of these kids. Because I really feel that is, that's the goal, is how good of a problem solving. Nobody is going to walk in. I used to ask my students totally open-ended questions they didn't know the answer to. They would go, well, we don't know that. We haven't been taught that. I said, great. I said, because that's what's going to walk in your class. Now, what are you going to do about it? Yeah. Because I think so much of education is about getting them to spit back what we've already taught them. No, that's just not how school works. That's not how these kids work. They don't come in with a little thing that says, here I am, and this is what you do, you know? So I think that would be the biggest message I tried to give out is, are you going to be that person? If yeah, you're not, you, then go find a different job. Are you going to be the one that finds the voice that helps them find their voice or their way to express because, or even, um, or even tries to find out what's in there and not just assume there's nothing. Yeah. You know, how, how dig are you, how, how much are you going to dig? How deep are you going to go? How much are you going to look for things versus look at what they cannot do? Are you going to look at what they can do or they cannot do? You know, that's, that's the problem I think is that in our whole school system in the U S is set up because they've got to like find all the reasons why they qualify for special ed because they can't do this. They can't do this. They can't do that. You know, I don't know. I, I think a lot of that is ridiculous. You know, you roll in to a to an evaluation. You can't talk. You can't use your hands. I think you qualify for special ed. Don't don't test me. Just hmm. figure out what I can do and go from there. But I but I do think that is the place where we are the weakest. I can I can speak, not just as a country, but everywhere I go, other countries, we're just weak in that regard. Yeah, because you've traveled the world quite a bit, right? 
and you have seen different cultures, do you, would you say there's different cultures that handle this differently? And what would be a culture where you've been like, wow, this is really beautiful how they handle these kids? But I find my Hispanic families to be naturally inclusive. I'm not trying to be put pigeonhole. It's my experience with my families that are of Hispanic descent. Yeah. The, the cousins are the cousins. Doesn't matter if they have Down syndrome. Doesn't matter if they have Red syndrome. It doesn't. They are just their cousins. And there is this sense with the grandma. Grandma has an, a, a sleepover with the grandkids and all the grandkids come. I have heard of families where the child with special needs is excluded. Hmm. How painful is that for a parent? How does a parent relate to their own parent when they're excluding one of their kids? How does that relationship ever heal? How, how does that relationship go forward? Does the mom or dad say, well, you don't take all of them, you don't get any of them? I mean, that's a horrible position, but to watch these families create this friend environment, this nurturing environment, this very perfectly inclusive environment, then you think to yourself, okay, that little girl with Down syndrome, that kid with, with Rett syndrome, they're learning how to form their first friendships within the family unit, which is supposed to be your safest place anyway, yeah. right? That mm -hmm. should be where we're all feeling like, whoa, this is where we're the most comfortable. We can let our hair down. It shouldn't matter what we say or do. People are going to love us no matter what. That isn't the case in all families. And so when you see this happen, you go, wow, this is really lovely. Then at our church, we're just inclusive in terms of our education program. We don't put our special ed kids in another room. We don't they they're worshiping with us. They're dancing in the back if that's what they want to do. They're, you know, it's just it's this inclusive environment that I think to myself, wow, this should be the way it is in schools. You know, I just got a letter from a parent, email from a parent saying, I have to prove my daughter can be included. They want to put her in a self-contained severe profound classroom. I'm like, you don't have to prove that in the U.S. The law is inclusion. But just because the law is inclusion doesn't mean that's the way it goes. And you and I both know, because the work we did in the Netherlands, girls weren't even going, going to school. They were in daycare. Yeah. That was this thing in Sweden. It drove me. I mean, that really blew me away is they're supposed to have the greatest schools. Everybody emulates their schools. And yet their complex kids were in daycare, not in school. And so that to me says a lot about what, what do you have to prove? What do we have to prove as people to be people? Mm -hmm. What is, what is the human is there, a, is there a line in the sand where if you can't cross that line, you're not human, you're not valued, you're not part of the society? And, and I read a quote once and I thought it was really great. It said, you can really tell the ethos, like the, the values, the morals of a culture by how well they treat the most vulnerable. Hmm. Man, you know, we're all flunking. We're all yep. flunking. And so I, I was in a school in England where um, the girl used a really nice yes, no. That teacher on her own said, you know what? I'll put a yes, no up by the board. Child was fully included. And I'll just ask questions every once in a while and everybody has to use her yes, no. Hmm. So use the communication wow. system of the child for yeah. other children as well. Yes, now here's what knocked me flat. I hadn't even thought about that. Yeah. This teacher, gen ed teacher, she just said, well, let's figure out how we can make this work. I'm in a kindergarten class now. I have a little girl in kindergarten. The teacher has a circle time. And every day has a different question or a different kind of thing you do, which we get, everybody gets in advance, not just my kid, but everybody gets in advance. And what I said to them in the last meeting, I said, boy, it's really lovely to have a kindergarten teacher that just naturally gets how to be inclusive. Hmm. Because in her kindergarten class, there's not only this young girl with Rhett, there are going to be out of a class of 20, 10% that have a learning disability, which means they don't process well. They don't have good command of, the less, of their language yet. Even in kindergarten, there's going to be kids where English is a second language. How yeah. nice that they all get this in advance so they can rehearse it and practice. Some of them are just yes, no questions. Do you want, do you like roller coasters or sleds? You know, would you rather do this or rather do that? Another one is what's the best thing about you? That needs some prep time. Yeah. 
there is this, this wonderful inclusive quality to that she didn't even realize she just does it yeah and what that does is it honors everybody in her classroom not just the kids that can think like that on their feet that was just a wonderful thing to see it was something really simple but something really beautiful in the fact that it really meets the needs of all kids and so you know that's like I don't know, a little piece of heaven that just kind of lands on your desk and you go, yes, I know how to do this. It's going to be a piece of cake to get this kid ready. She's yeah. going to be able, and that's, and that's just it. I mean, we just set up her talker. We just, you know, worked on the yes, no, and she's ready to just answer like everybody else. Yeah. Oh. That's great. So yeah. you're talking about the yes, no, um, the people that watch this um, podcast or listen to this podcast, could you explain how to do that? If there's people that don't know what you're talking about? Well, it like, just so happens. I have a yes board sitting right next to me, but I will also talk about a way to do it without even a yes board. So oftentimes I find a hundred percent in kids with rep practically, Yes. But also with kids with autism and my kids with CP is that they look at me for yes. And where it starts is with agreement. It doesn't start with me saying, is an elephant big? You know, is, is this dog brown? That's where everybody wants to start is with these questions that are like, what? We're, we haven't to now do right, wrong questions. And we're just learning what a yes, no is. But agreement is the first place this starts. So I say, oh my gosh, I just am so tired of waiting. And that, and that kid will look at me like, yeah, you and me too, sister. You know, it's just a natural <laughs> gesture that you don't have to spend a whole lot of time training. Yeah. Again, if you offer somebody food and they don't want it, they move their head away. They've just shown you an, the ability to, to do a, a, you know, a gestural no. And yeah. so then what I do is I take that yes, I make sure they know, oh, you're telling me yes, you're agreeing with me, I gotcha, you know, or, oh, you are telling me no way, Susan, there is no way I want to do that, there is no way I want to eat it. And so we take the little and we amplify it. We take these little tiny signs that could be just a slight look over, a slight look away, a mm -hmm. slight grimace, a, a slight smile. And we amplify the message so that they now say, wait, that thing I did, that thing I did made her react so nicely. And guess what? I, she's, she's getting that I'm agreeing with her. So I'm going to do that thing again. Instead of trying to teach people from the outside in, and I will say that the worst thing that happened in the States is this whole behavioral movement, and it's taken over in other parts of the world. But this behavioral movement is all about from the outside in. Mm -hmm. Instead of from the top down, inside out. And I think what you teach kids and adults, because I work with, you know, my oldest client, I just started with two years ago, I was 47. Wow. So I started with her when she was 45. And in her day and age, when she was young, people did nothing with her. She didn't have a device till she was 47, till I met her. So this is a, a newbie just in an old person's body. But her slightest signal she was giving to me got amplified to the point where she has got an excellent yes, no. Now, what I tend to do then is if they say yes, I go, oh, I always sit on the yes side, which is the left side, which looks like the right side to me, but probably looks like the left side to you. Yeah. But I'll turn around with the camera, but I always sit on the yes side. So when they look to me for yes, I can say, oh, you're telling me yes. And people say, well, if they already have the yes, no, why do you bother? You know, I have seen kids get contractures. I have seen kids get less mobility. I have seen kids really have bad scoliosis. And for whatever reason, parents not decide to fix it or do anything about it. Some of the kids are too fragile to do anything about. Some of it is just parental fear, whatever it is. And this isn't just my kids with breath. This is my kids with cerebral palsy. So I even had a boy that had, um, that had um, scoliosis with autism. So if they cannot now move their head with the same amount of flexibility as they did, they can at the very least move their eyes left or right. And when you show them that the yes is always to this side and the no is to here, you can even have it away and they're still getting the yes and the no. That's a skill they have. I have to teach them how to read and write. I have mm -hmm. to teach them how to decode words. 
I have high goals for all of my kids. And I'll tell you, they're meeting those goals. If I can get a school to buy into what I am saying to do, I've got eighth graders reading at a sixth grade level. There's some kids with learning disabilities that would love to only be two years behind. And these are kids that have missed a year of school because they had to have scoliosis surgery and hip surgery or, you know, whatever, or it takes them 10 times as long to answer a question. But, you know, we have, we have a woman right now, Joe Picard, who is in college in Canada, who, who types with her eyes like nothing I have ever seen. I mean, she's like a whiz bang. The amount, when you listen to how much time it takes her to put things together, that she graduated high school and that she's in college is not only a testimony to the fact that at five, her mother came to hear me speak. And I said, tell me what you did that she's like this. She goes, well, I remember you saying they can learn to read and write. So I took her home and taught her to read and write. Yeah, if it was only that easy. But let's see who that was. That was a parent who's a teacher. How often does do our kids walk into school and somebody says, okay, now we're going to teach you to read and write. If, if your goal, and I say this to all my parents, I, if somebody wants to hire me, I say to them, okay, I just want to let you know that my goal is that they be fully communicative and they're going to be fully communicative. They have to learn to read and write. That means we're going to get school on board. We're going to get you on board. We're going to get me on board. I'm going to show you what to do, but this doesn't happen by somebody just seeing me once a week or twice a week. Yeah. or three times a week. Mm -hmm. This happens because we have a, a family around it. We have a school around it. And we have people committed to people learning, not committed to the status quo. I just, it, it breaks my heart sometimes when I see these kids in fifth grade, fourth grade that, that have no skills whatsoever when it comes to communication or, or somebody saying, I just, I just got a 27 year old whose mother said, I know she could communicate by eye gaze. I know she can all through her school years. Now this is not that long ago if she's 27, all through her school years, especially those end ones where eye gaze was pretty prevalent in the States for kids with Rutt syndrome, where they said, nah, she can't do it. Hmm. They wouldn't even try it. How can you not try it? It just, to me, that's a crime that you wouldn't try to help somebody be more communicative. So it's a very, um, it's a very mixed bag. And I think that at the basis, we started this whole talk with communication, or I mean with inclusion. If you wanna start at the base of inclusion, you have to start at the base of, I believe you're in there and I wanna make sure you can do the most that you can do, which means that you better be a part of your community. Yeah not just your family community, that's where it starts, but you're going to be a part of your school community. That's your next community. And people need to not see that as a burden or, or something to argue over or something that you're going to move them in and out for circle time. And then they have to, you know, come out for, you know, my kids that are most successful in inclusion are spending the majority of their time in the inclusion classroom and they're getting pulled out for reading support. They're getting pulled out for math support and writing because they need a different kind of instruction because they don't gain skills as fast. But that doesn't mean that we don't take what's happening in the classroom and make that work for them also. So they may get a half hour. Like I have a girl in, in Tennessee who had this amazing teacher the last time I was there last year. <laughs> the third grade teacher who was like, loved this kid and had her in her small group and was working on word problems and figured out a way to have her answer the questions. I showed her some other strategies. She was invested. This was her kid. This wasn't some special ed kid who just came and went every once in a while. This was her student. And that's the part that I think we definitely need to do a better part, a better job at is supporting gen ed teachers in that sense of these are your kids without abandoning them to do the whole deal. That's not their training. Now we're not trained in special ed how to teach reading, write and writing. I mean, I've all got all of that since I've been out of school. So they can help us, we can help them mm. and not have it be this territorial thing. But it all starts from the fact that that's their kid. Yeah. So what would you say helps people to get to that point that they actually 
like and become that invested? So I ran an inclusion program for about five years in the district that my kids go to. They hired me as a consult. We were bringing back all of the kids with autism that had been outplaced. Okay. That's a big thing to do. So it was like, we had like four kids, which seems small, but four kids all in the same grade level. And what we did first is I had a, I had a meeting with all the teachers and I said, I didn't want any of the administration there, just me and the teachers. I said, so this is what we're going to do. We're going to write on this board, all the concerns you have, all the worries, all you think, all the ways you think this isn't going to work. Let's get it out there. You know, and nobody wanted to say anything. I said, okay, I'm going to go up first and I'm going to say, man, I have enough work to do. I don't need one more kid that's got issues. And, and then that opened the bridge, you know, and everybody just started putting all of their fears and concerns up there. And I just put them into categories. And I kind of looked at it and I said, you know, what I'm seeing is I am seeing a lot of teachers that are afraid they're not going to know what to do. I'm seeing a lot of teachers that do their best by kids every single day, but you're just afraid you're not going to know how to do it. I wonder if I said that I can help you with that. I wonder if I said I'm going to be there. So we all decided, I mean, we, we kind of cherry picked which teachers were going to get kids based on how flexible they were. Flexible is good. They don't have to know everything. They just have to be flexible. Go with the flow because yeah. man, sometimes it just, you know, gets away from you. Um, but it also helped me to have teachers that could plan. that didn't necessarily teach by the seat of their pants. So those creative teachers that on a whim don't have lesson plans, just on a whim, they're going to do this. It's like, I can't prep for that. So I had to get flexible teachers, but teachers also that had some planning. That was helpful. The next thing we did is we had parents. We had parent like um, focus groups, brought parents in, said, okay, what are your fears? You know, it's going to take away from my kid. Wonder if my kid can't learn as much. Wonder if they're aggressive, blah, 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 blah. I mean, they were just, you know, bloop. And I'm not downplaying their fears. Those are all our concerns too. I said, you know what? You have the same concerns I do. This is my job. And I've got to figure out how to support those kids and make sure that your kids get the same good education they would otherwise get. Yeah. And so explain getting down at the level of their fears and having it be okay to have them really, really important. Now, now we did the next level. We go into the classrooms and we talk to the kids and there's no such thing as a bad question and there's no such thing as a mean question and there's no such thing as not the question to ask no. because the minute you button people up and don't let them get their questions out the minute they're going to invent answers on their own i learned that so so well and i'll tell you a couple of things happened our first and some of the kids we had were screaming memes i mean these were not like little docile kids and we the building we were in was overcrowded so we had kids in mobile units it was a horrible first year i mean horrible first year not first super first well one. facilitated physically like in space in rooms in yeah, no, oh, challenging. Because we've got these kids with autism that the minute they're screaming, of course we have to take them out, but I can't take them out to their work because there's no place. Yeah. There's no extra space. So the, after the first year, I remember the principal saying about this one kid in particular, what do you think? Do you think he can, it's really a good thing for him to be here? I said, we didn't, haven't had a chance. You give me one more year where I have a room I can take him to where he comes out of that room and his work is sitting for him in the next room and he's going to learn. He can't scream to get out of doing work. I can't, I can't teach him that in this environment. Sure enough, he was all the way through eighth grade. So that was great. So first open house, I love my first open house kindergarten. We had these, this screaming guy in kindergarten and the um, a mom came up to me and says, I have just one question. And in my head, I'm going, Oh gosh, I hope it's not a hard one. She said, is my son being kind? Hmm. I said, no, actually, your son is one of the most inclusive kids. He's making sure this kid has something to do on the playground. He's making sure that if he's upset, he comes over and gives him a pat on the back and say, it'll be okay. Oh, that's nice. That's really nice. I had another little guy who um, his, his mom said, you know, he really is struggling on the playground. He's kind of walking around in circles. So I had a class meeting, second graders. 
said to the teacher, you want to do it? Or she goes, no, you do it. That's fine. I sat down with them and I said, you know, the problem here, one of our friends is circling the playground. And I got to tell you, it's been a long time since I've played on the playground. So I'm coming to my play experts. What can you help me with? What could we do? They had like 10 great ideas in like 10 minutes. And then they took it over and the kid was playing on the playground with them, totally engaged. And to me, that wasn't, that was empowering them to be part of the solution. If we do everything for them and that's just tell them how to act, they're not going to own it and know what to do later on. So we'll, for, we'll circle back. I'm at the next open house, <laughs> you know, where they have all these things with parents. The parent comes up to me and said, I just got to tell you a story. I'm like, okay, great. She goes, we're in church. This man gets up. He starts flapping his arms and talking out loud and sits back down. And my son nudges me. He goes, don't worry, mom. It's okay. He just has autism. <laughs> this is the kindergartner reassuring his mom. This guy just has autism and it's just going to be fine. And I'm thinking to myself, these are the kids yeah. that we want to be our future senators, house of representatives, people who set budgets for education. Yeah. People that vote for people based on how they set budgets for education. Because when you have, and I will tell you that the teachers at the junior high, because again, I followed these kids up through junior high, the, the teachers of the junior high kids that this particular class that had four kids in it was with more extreme needs than just a learning disability yeah. were the nicest, kindest kids they've had. Where did yeah. that come from? Where did they yeah, because they out? saw it as normal because you learn what the world looks like, you know, in those early years in school. And when you see the kids there, okay, this is normal. This is what we do. This is what the world looks like. This, there's people that are maybe a little different that have autism, have Down syndrome, have Rett syndrome, you name it. And they are just part and that we, we will support them. Um, and I think, yes, that's probably a story that many people can relate to when the kids actually have seen it. Yes. And do it. They do. Again, we're inside out here, not outside in, inside yeah. out. The other thing is, imagine that you are a child that has a problem come up in your life, which happens to probably most every child at some point. And now you see people that are different being treated worse. How open are you going to be about sharing your need or your problem? So to think about this as only helping kids with special needs, I think is really short-sighted mm. because I think that what it, an inclusive environment says is you are valued, whether you're producing the same as somebody else, whether you can attend the same as somebody else, whether you're struggling or not struggling. And I will tell you, when I look at the statistics on emotional issues for children, we better get this right. Or we're not going to know who has an issue until it's too late, because they're going to be afraid in an environment that is too narrow in its acceptance. Yeah. Then those kids are going to be left out too. Now we're talking about kids of color. We talk about kids from other nationalities. Kids are coming in with English as a second language. This idea of inclusion goes way beyond just kids with special needs. It, we need to have a most, more inclusive environment, period. Yeah. So what would you say to adults that did not grow up with these kids in their classrooms and just maybe really feel uncomfortable or feel like, I just don't know, because it's new, because it's different. Well, I guess it would depend on what position they're in. Do you know what I'm saying? If I'm a parent or I'm out with somebody with special needs and somebody seems a bit like put off, I'm like pretty open and honest and say, you know, she understands everything you say. She'd love to hear what you have to offer. I do think that like, there's an adult program that I have two women in with Brett. One's 33, one's 47. But when we go to the grocery store and I'm helping one of my women to make a choice, I'm conscious of the fact that how I phrase it is being heard also by somebody else. 
but then we'll be able to understand that this person might look a certain way, but that doesn't mean she needs to be treated a certain way. Mm -hmm. And that if they look over and I say, oh, I said, this is Marissa, would you like to meet her? You know, just simple things like that, where I think that it is very difficult. I mean, my generation, I can remember saying to my mother in my neighborhood was a little girl named Brenda. Brenda definitely had a cognitive disorder of some kind. Um, she could talk, but she, nobody made fun of her around me. At least <laughs> nobody made fun of her. But I said to my mother, where does she go to school? She's not at my school. She goes, well, she doesn't go to school. That's how old I am at that time. People like Brenda didn't go to school. Yeah. It's like this big, like, what? Why wouldn't she go to school? I mean, it was just so like, I don't know. It was like a real slap in the face to me. I took that personally. Why? Why is that? That's where we begin. Mm. Can you imagine what it would be like to be her or him? Can you imagine what it would be like to have no friends except people who are paid to be with you? Can you imagine that? Can you imagine that when you go into a group, you never are in the group? I remember going to a party. This was um, one of Bill's really good high school friends has an outdoor party. They have a band. It's great every summer. One of the families brought their daughter. She's in a wheelchair. I'm assuming she had CP. I mean, I, that would be my assumption. I mean, she, I don't know. I don't, I don't know. Anyway, and I went over to them, said hello, and then bent down to talk with her. And they looked at me like I was like, who are you? And what are you doing? And I really, and I watched her and I could pick up pretty quickly a, what her yes was and what her no was. And we just had a little chat about the music and, you know, who, who I was and, you know, what was going on. I mean, it wasn't anything deeper, you know, personal or anything. But I then went back to sit down and I was so like appalled. These are friends of that family and nobody bent down to say anything to this child. Yeah. So, so I think in those environments, you lead by your example. You lead by your example. But I do think that everybody holds a piece of this. It's like a big parachute we're all holding yeah and we all have to do our part wherever we are we're ambassadors we're not just ambassadors for the person with a disability we're ambassadors to the world about people with disabilities i mean there's so many prejudices in our world this is just one of them yeah and but it's just as important as racial disparity as educational disparity as cultural disparity it's it's just as important and then when you mix a group that is disenfranchised with special needs. So I just read some interesting research um, on, a, on a document that was going to the Biden administration and talking about the disparity for our black, brown, indigenous children in terms of how much less they'll receive an AAC device if they're nonverbal. Mm. It's horrible. Yeah. He's got the double whammy. <laughs> now we're not even worried about inclusion in this kind of utopia of what we'd like it to look like. We just like to even the playing field where it is for these kids. And so for me, I mean, there's a lot of battles to be fought, but I, I still think the best way to fight them is not to fight, is to be an example, is to support, is to help, is to is to say, yeah, we can figure out a way to make that work. More than that, they're doing right by all the kids in their classroom. I, I really do believe that to be true. I, I believe that we have way more kids with hidden issues than we know about. And the best way to not have them hide is to have everybody feel safe and included. I think that's a very big message also from the last two episodes, that sense of, oh, I can be open about I feel uncomfortable I feel just a little bit not at ease around maybe someone with a disability and actually when we're open about that that opens 
you know, the, the key, that's really a key to connection and actually getting to know each other and maybe even asking questions. And like you said, I like what you said, there's no wrong questions give people space to ask the questions because if you don't they will start to figure out the answers in their own head and they might not be the right answers yeah and i also think too let's take a look at a family that has a child with a disability and all of a sudden the mom's friends or the dad's friends aren't sure what to say or what to do so they draw back and the parent is probably grieving and angry and all kinds of things are going on when they first find out they're not exactly the best company and they're not exactly in a state where they can be helpful to a friend. It should be the other way around. And I think at that time, the best thing friends can do is say, I have no idea what to say. I have no idea what to do. I have no idea what you're going through, but I'm not going anywhere. Yeah. I'm your friend, because I love you. Those are, if, if, if people could just say those things and really mean them, that is a bridge at a time where the whole thing is a hot mess. I, I did parent infant, so I worked zero to three for many, many years. When parents are first finding out, it just brings tears to my eyes. I like it. <laughs> I get so emotional over this. But when they are first finding out, it's like a trauma. It is just, yeah. it, it is like blood force trauma on that family. And for some families, more traumatic than other families. But ultimately, it's going to be traumatic. Whether you deal with it now or you deal with it 10 years later, it's going to be traumatic. When you're in trauma, you're in a flight or fright situation. You're not in a logical, you're not in a, oh, no, my poor friends, they're not quite to understand. Oh, no, 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 no. You cannot do that. So what friends and family need to do is just be honest and say, I don't know what to say. I'm sure if I say something, it's going to be the wrong thing. I'm going to say things that you're going to hate. Tell me that you hate it because I don't hate you. You, I yeah. love. You, I love. I am sad this is happening to you. I am sad that you're dealing with this, but I'm not going anywhere. And so maybe you're the, you're the person that drops off a meal once in a while, or you're the person that sends over, you know, just a card saying, thinking of you. Or a person that comes over and says, I'm just going to sit with you. You know, can I hold your screaming baby while you take a shower? You know what regression's like for a lot of these kids. It's horrible. Yeah. Or stomach issues or constipation or seizures, or we can go down the list of things these parents are dealing with. And if somebody were just to say, I'll come hold her while you can take a shower. I have to tell you a funny story. I'm in, I'm doing parent infant, right? And we have this group of really complex kids. I mean, really complex. And there is, this is at the time where my partner is on maternity leave. So I'm full time. So I've got her, I've got me, a speech therapist and an OT for like nine kids. And they all need one-to-one -one because they're for positioning. They, you know, for, they choke. They're, I mean, it's a whole mess. And we want the parents to go to a parent support group. We have somebody there to work with them. So I'm like, okay, I'm going to call this, you know, ladies group. And, you know, there's a ladies club in Northbrook. We'll call them. We have a contact. Maybe they'd like to come and volunteer. They're like, oh man, they are just like thrilled to come and volunteer. And they all show up in their really nice little outfits and their white pants and their cute little you know, tennis shoes. I mean, they're just like ladies. The only thing that was missing was the gloves. You know, they were ladies and my kids throw up on them, spit on them, poop on them. And I thought, okay, that's it. They're never coming back. We're going to have to rework this whole thing. Oh no, 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 no. These ladies came back the next week in their blue jeans and in their crummy tennis shoes and in their sweatshirts. And they were there for those kids. Yeah. So those moms could have some respite. I will tell you, my estimate of these ladies skyrocketed. I was like, you are the rock and the salt of the earth. I love them. Yeah. Love and, them. and it's really that easy to be a friend as in, I will hold your baby. I will watch your child while you take a shower or um, like even you go out and have your coffee while it's hot. <laughs> Wouldn't that be nice? It's those simple things. It would be like, hey, I'm at the store. Can I pick up something for you? Yeah. It's not like you have to turn them into the, the neighborhood charity case. If this is a friend of yours, then act like a friend. And what do friends do? 
Are you going to be uncomfortable? Sure. You don't know what to say. You don't know what to do. You don't have to. They don't know what they want to hear anyway. They That's don't. True. If, you were to, if you were to ask a parent when they're going through this, what would you like to hear? They would go, I don't know. They don't no. know. They just want somebody to be there and yeah. to admit, I might be saying all the wrong things. Don't say, and for God's sake, do not say, oh, God picks out special parents to parent children with special needs. No, he doesn't. No, that's not how parents feel. They feel like, no, I just got this and I've got to learn how to deal with it. I'm nothing special about me. There's nothing special about me. Yeah. No, you'll become a little more special as time goes on because you figure things out. Yeah, but that's not helpful. <laughs> that's not helpful. But I think just being there is, I do. Yeah, yeah, simply being there, simply staying present and being open about, okay, this is uncomfortable, but hey, I know you and we have got history. So I'm not going to abandon you over this. Um, and I like what you said, like very practical when you're at the store or when you're at the store that we only go to every once in a while. Like there are certain stores that are farther away that you don't go, at, go to every week. But maybe sometimes you have like, oh, I need actually this thing from that store to just send a text message. I'm at the store or I'm going to the store. Would there be anything that you need? Because then also you give them a little bit of time in advance to think of, oh yes, I would need this. Right, and I also think to say, what can I do for you? What, which, how can I help you? They don't know. And I think that puts them in an uncomfortable spot. Yeah. I can just do something and say, I don't know if this is gonna be helpful or not, but I'd like to come and sit with Joey while you have a chance to go take a walk. Yeah. You know, babysitting, oh my gosh, babysitting for kids with special needs, horrendously hard. Yeah, it's difficult. We know if we don't nurture that couple, the divorce rate is bad enough. The divorce rate among families with kids with special needs is even worse. Yeah. So we should, our goals as a community, whether we're involved with special needs or not, but our goals as a community is to keep families together, straight off the board, just keep families together. What can we do to help? You know, now I'm older. I have grandkids, but I don't have the daily grind of kids. I can be helpful to people. Yeah. I can do things. I can volunteer. I can, you know, there's just, there's a lot of things that can be helpful. I can be somebody's grandma who doesn't have a grandma close. And that can be very helpful to parents or parents who don't, whose grandma won't. And I think what you said, like community helping the couple or helping the parents to actually support this because it's a lot. Like there's grief, there's maybe other kids. Um, the time zone or the time frame, three kids under the age of six, you know, is it's not the easiest time zone in someone's life or that, you know, like that's, that's a season where it's just the grind of every day is hard enough. And then put on top of that grieving about the kids uh, or the fact that your kid might have a different future than you had expected and all the care that all of a sudden kind of is dumped on you. Right. Like, okay, now you have to learn all these medical skills. If your child has medical needs that are really different. Right. It's like, you never volunteered for it. You don't know how to do it, but you get to learn. Like you have to learn because not doing it is not an option. This is true. I think I've, because of my age, maybe I have seen the width and breadth. I've seen parents that just blow me away. I see your, you know, average parent that's just barely making it. But I, but I do think sometimes I look at families and I go, wow, man, look at all the A, B, C through Z. And they're just like, you know, here we are. They're just carrying on, which is, which is wonderful. I mean, it's wonderful. It, it always comes at a cost, though. It always comes at a cost. So it's, it's hard to carry on when there's so many things that are like bombarding you. And I really feel for, for my parents. And then we look at the economic divide. I met some families when I was working at a school in um, Boston, amazing school. These were the most medically fragile kids I've ever seen. And there's this one young man whose mother lives in a third floor walk up, no dad, and she has to carry him up because there's no elevator. He's 19. He's not little. He's a mm. man. And then you say, okay, all right. And she's doing it and she loves him and she stays upbeat. And you're like, how is she doing this every single day? 
yeah every single day and there should be something there that makes it possible for her not to have to do that the the countries i've been in i always say nothing was as bad as when i went to haiti mm -hmm. my mission trip on haiti and i'm going how do i get these kids devices well by the way we don't always have electricity at the all the time and we walked into this orphanage and um the lady put her arm around me and said you know these children just cannot learn and i went well yeah, game on lady. <laughs> You're going to see what they're going to learn in a week. And in a week, they're pointing to symbols and they're engaged. And she's like, I just can't believe this. And I think there's nobody there to teach them. Yeah. So third world countries, I mean, we go, we can go through the, you know, the highs and the lows here. That's the poorest country in the world. And you're just going, or in the Western hemisphere, sorry, not the world, Western hemisphere. Yeah. And, and yet you see what's the hopeful thing. Kids are kids. Do the right thing, engage them, do things that are fun, give them the power to communicate and look what you got. You got kids who are learning. Even though we didn't speak the language, they didn't speak our language. Symbols are the, the unifier. Yeah. And we're all just, you know, singing uh, in, uh, you know, in uh, French, Haitian French. Those moments are what drive me forward. There is nothing I'm not going to do to help kids succeed. And there's nothing I'm not gonna to do to help a family succeed. And I think that if I could change one thing about pre-service for teachers, it would be that. They need a course on how to teach nonverbal kids to read. That's when I, I mean, that's when I got frustrated and did Rhett University. I'm like, okay, I'm just gonna put stuff out there that kid act, people actually need to learn. Yeah. But I think until we start to really look at how we're training teachers, how we're supporting families. I mean, this has got to be an all out effort. And people say, well, that's so much money. Yeah, it's so much money to waste a life too. Mm -hmm. It's a lot of money to have a family disintegrate. It's a lot of money to have somebody like this young man where somebody saw his capability and put a touch writer so he could use his feet. And now he's got two master's degrees and he's married. Yeah. Do we want to waste that life? Is it too much money to make sure that he gets an education? Uh -uh. Nah. No, Sorry. no, and I think just that basic, um, like you start from every kid has a capacity to learn. Oh, every so kid, and it might be a different level. Not all will go to graduate level. Not all, you know, there's, but that's the same in all of community. Well, it's the same, right? It's like, I, I have a family of four kids. I have one son in this college. It's not in his future. Yeah. I have another one where he could be the genius in college and choosing not to go. Yeah. So, you know, I, you know, I can remember when I adopted my kids, I have a birth, one birth child and three adopted kids. And somebody said, grab a black magic marker and write on the wall. I do not have control over much. <laughs> it's like really true. How much control do we have? We don't. But what we have control over is what we do. Yeah. What is done to us, not what is thrown our way, but what we do. And so I like to help parents be able to feel competent with their kids. It's not enough that I feel competent with their kids. They have to feel competent with their own kids. Yeah. I want teachers to feel competent. I want them saying, wow, this is really cool. I love how this works. I can't believe this. That's what I want. I had a teacher, I was doing a consult, a, a Zoom today with a teacher who has one of my kindergartners. And she went, oh my gosh, now I know how to do this. She rocked this. She knew every word that started the same. She knew exactly what letter she needed to spell the words. I'm like, ah, she caught it. She caught the, I see it. Now I want to make it happen. That's what I want. Yeah, that's what I want. I remember, like, I mean, that's, and I've taught um, or told um, a group of teachers that we brought together in the Netherlands last week um, a, the story of how I watched on my little phone you and Polly in Chicago, her spelling her name. And I'm like, she's five, she was five years old at the time. A little bitty. And that was a girl with red syndrome that all of a sudden was able to spell her name. And that for me just like took the lids off. Like, yeah. Wow. I remember that. Boy, that was a long time ago. <laughs> so much that's possible. And it's, it's really, it starts with, with our own beliefs of the person that's in front of us. 
-hmm. what do I believe about you? Do I believe that you're capable of choosing whatever you want to do, of going after whatever uh, profession that you would want to go after, or at least that you would be able to learn to read and write and to tell me something about what you did today and to be uh, part of our community um, and not only value the, you know, if you can reach certain levels, if you can do certain things, if you have certain skills. Um, yeah. Thank good you. Session. You're welcome. My pleasure. <laughs> it's so good. Um, thank you for your time. Thank you for just this conversation. I think there's uh, definitely some really good nuggets in there that we can share and um, yeah, I could just chew on even. Like and thank you for having me because as we speak things out into the world, it, it makes us do it more. Yes, yes, definitely. As we speak it out, as we say like, hey, it's about the heart. It's about seeing the people. It's about seeing the person. It's about going after community as a community being like, hey, we're going to support you. We're going to come around you. We're not giving up. We're not giving up on you. It might be tough. It's a tough season. It might be tough multiple years. Um, but we're going to help a great you. way to end this talk with we're not giving up. We're not giving up. 